Hello and welcome to this video in which I want to address the question of whether standardized regression coefficients can be larger than one and what that means in cases where it happens. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm an instructor with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate statistical models including structural equation modeling, factor analysis, multi-level analysis, and latent class modeling. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, don't forget to check out the description for additional resources, including workshops that I teach for Quantfish. So in this video, I want to address an issue in regression analysis that confuses many people, and that is when they find a standardized regression coefficient that is greater than one. And so before we get into why this is possible, what this means, what you should do about it, I want to show you an example so you can see that this can actually happen. And so here I have the free program JASP open. I have a data file with a dependent variable Y and two predictor variables X1 and X2. And so I want to run a multiple, re multiple linear regression model with those two predictor variables and show you what we get in this example. So we go to regression and then linear regression. And so I'm going to move my dependent variable into this field here and my two independent variables or predictors into the covariates field. And then you can see that on the right hand side already my linear regression results tables are provided by JASP. By the way, JASP is a great free statistics program, one of the best, most user-friendly free programs that I've seen so far for various statistical analyses, including regression, but also, as you can see, it allows you to do ANOVA, t-test, descriptive statistics, and even factor analysis, both exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis structural equation modeling, reliability analysis, and so on. And I have a whole playlist on this channel where I show various types of analyses and how to conduct them in JASP. So check that out as well. Now back to our regression. Let's take a look at the output for this regression model. You can see that under H1, we get the multiple correlation R for our model with two predictors. And you can see it's a very, it's a very substantial multiple correlation of 0.86 which translates into R squared of 0.742. So 74.2% of the variance in the dependent variable here explained, which is a lot, even the adjusted R squared is similarly large. So this is a very substantial prediction here. So to say a very good model fit in terms of explained variance. You can see the F statistic is significant. So this model has a significant multiple correlation, which doesn't surprise us because 0.86 is very strong. Now, when we get, take a look at the coefficients table where we find our unstandardized and standardized regression coefficients, we can see that in terms of the unstandardized coefficients, we find them here in the first column. And for unstandardized coefficients, it doesn't surprise us that one is above one because unstandardized coefficients depend on the metric of our uh, variables. So it depends entirely on how they are scaled. And so therefore, this is definitely something that can happen for intercept and slope coefficients that they could be greater than one or smaller than negative one. More surprising to most people is the result that is found here under the standardized coefficients. And you can see that one is negative 1.113 and the other standardized coefficient is positive 1.473. And so this is something that a lot of people would think, oh, this is weird. Um, is this a problem with my, is there a problem with my regression model? Is this inadmissible? Is this maybe an improper solution? Did something go wrong here? Because a lot of people think that standardized regression coefficients have a similar range or the same range as do correlation coefficients, which are bound between negative one and positive one. However, standardized regression coefficients in a multiple regression model are not bound by negative one and positive one. So that's just simply not the case. Those are partial regression coefficients. 
that do not only depend on the correlation of each predictor with the dependent variable, but also on the correlation between the predictor variables with one another. So the multicollinearity or the collinearity, the correlation among the predictors is taken into account when these partial regression coefficients are estimated. And so therefore they are not bound by negative one and positive one. So the first so say conclusion here is this can happen and it's not necessarily indicative of a problem. But then what does it mean? So what does this indicate? For that, it is useful to take a look at the zero order bivariate correlations between the three variables to understand what effect is going on here. What causes these results that are admittedly unusual. Typically, we do have standardized coefficients that are not outside of that range of negative one and positive one, but it can happen. And here it did happen. So let's take a look at why this happened. And we get a correlation matrix in JASP under the same regression function. You can see here under classical, the first option is correlation. And there's also a very convenient option that is similar to SPSS. You just select your variables on the left hand side, you click them over into the variables field. And then on the right hand side, you get your correlation table. You can see that the dependent variable y is barely correlated with x1. So x1 has a Pearson correlation with a dependent variable of only 0.084 and it's not statistically significant. The p-value here is 0.349, not significant, and the effect size is also small, 0.08. So no substantial correlation of the first predictor with a criterion and yet we get this very substantial um, in terms of its absolute value, this very substantial regression coefficient as we saw previously. So let's hold on for a second and um, let's see what else we got here to find out why this happened. Next, the correlation of the second predictor with the criterion variable is 0.567. So that's very substantial. That's a strong effect, a large effect size in terms of Cohen's guidelines for Pearson's R as an effect size measure. And it's statistically significant at the 0.05 level. The p-value is point smaller than 0.001. So this is a substantial correlation. So the second predictor is substantially correlated with a dependent variable, the first predictor is not. And now comes the really important part of this data example, where you can see that the correlation between the two predictor variables, x1 and x2, is actually also really substantial. And this is the largest correlation in the matrix, 0.813. So there's a high correlation between the two predictors that is very strong and it's significant, obviously, as well. And so this is what explains the effect that we saw in our regression. So let's go back to our regression output. And let's keep in mind that we have the scenario where the first predictor is not substantially correlated with a dependent variable, the second predictor is substantially correlated with the dependent variable, and the two predictor variables are very substantially correlated. Under this effect, we have what is called suppression or a suppressor effect. So the suppressor effect means that the first predictor, which is not substantially correlated with a criterion, but is substantially correlated with the other predictor, suppresses irrelevant variance in the second predictor. So variance that is not relevant for the prediction of the dependent variable and therefore enhances or improves the predictive ability of the second predictor. And I have a separate video on this channel about suppression. So check that out as well. In that video, I go more into the theoretical details of what a suppressor effect is, how that's defined and how you can find that out. But this is so to say the reason why we find these high standardized coefficients, high in absolute size. And so you can see both of them are significant. So both of them have T values that are very substantial in terms of the absolute value. And both P values are significant, even though the first predictor was not significantly correlated with the dependent variable, as we saw in the correlation table here. So yet, even though this is not significant, the uh, regression weight is significant for that predictor. And that shows you it's a suppressor. 
It's a suppressor situation where the utility of x1 for the prediction of y really comes from the suppression of irrelevant variance in the second predictor. So it's an, so it's an indirectly useful predictor for y because it does help make x2 a better predictor. It improves x2. Yeah, so x2 alone would not be such a good predictor of y, but when x1 is also in the model, then x2 is an even better predictor because now irrelevant variance and in x2 is suppressed. And this is called classical suppression or traditional suppression because the f with traditional suppression, the x1 suppressor variable is not or at least not substantially correlated with the dependent variable, but it is substantially correlated with the other variable, with the other predictor variable in the model. And then you have this scenario where the r squared is higher with the suppressor in the model as compared to when the suppressor is not in the model. And you can see that when we remove x1 from our model, which in JASP is very um, easy to do because then your output file just simply is changed. So now I kicked out x1 from the model and you can see the multiple correlation drops to 0.567. So that's really the bivariate correlation between x2 and y, as you can see here, so that's the same value. And so the r squared drops to 0 0.322 when x1 is not in the model. So even though x1 is not substantially correlated with y, it does help to improve the prediction. So when we put x1 back in to the model, you can see that r squared increases to 0 0.742 again. So x1 is an indirectly uh, useful predictor, so to say. And now our regression coefficients here, in that case, they can become greater than one or smaller than negative one when we have strong a strong suppression effect, as in this case. So this would be the thing to think of. When you have this case of standardized regression coefficients that are abnormally large and or that have a sign that is unexpected, so an unexpected negative sign or unexpected positive sign based on the zero order correlations, then you should think of the suppression effect as one possible explanation for that. So in summary, yes, standardized regression coefficients are allowed to be greater than one or smaller than negative one. It's not per se a sign of a problem with the model. It does not mean something is invalid or wrong. It typically means you have a suppressor effect in your data. It also means that the interpretation of the regression coefficients in terms of the substantive interpretation is probably compromised. So you probably cannot really interpret those in terms of the direction of the relationship. That wouldn't make sense. However, the model as such may not be wrong. It may not be problematic and a suppressor variable can help you increase R squared, can help you make your prediction better, reduce your standard error of um, prediction or the standard error of um, the estimate can be reduced by that R square can be improved. And uh, therefore, this is not necessarily a bad thing. I hope you found this video useful to learn more about standardized regression coefficients in multiple regression analysis. If you did, then please subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to check out the description for additional videos and workshops. And I'll see you next time.